Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another one of our uh, Lumix Live uh, events here on YouTube. Um, we're taking a bit of a change from what we've done over the last week uh, and moving more towards a, uh, a kind of tech-ish heavy uh, stream this week where we're going to be actually diving into some of the different features that the Lumix cameras offer for pretty much almost every kind of you know style of photography out there. Um, so that you can kind of have a better understanding of what you have in the tools that you've got in front of you now. So, like we said, a bit of a change from last week. We're going to be focusing primarily on a lot of the photography-oriented features across the Lumix line of cameras. But for those of you that are video shooters, a number of the things that I'm going to cover will be fairly relevant to your, your application as well. Um, we're going to cover, uh, basically as an outline here, some landscape photography tools that are in this camera, uh, different modes that are set up to assist for product photographers. Uh, we're going to touch on some of the uh, wildlife photography aspects of what our cameras can do and some tech that they can help you out in the field. Um, and then really for right now too, you know, some portrait photography with different uh, portrait profiles, different focus modes. Uh, and then if we have time, touch on some flash photography capabilities since the system across the board is fairly well capable and compatible with a number of different flashes out there, uh, including our own. And then we'll wrap it up with some uh, additional features that we have in uh, most of the uh, you know, newer, higher end Lumix cameras for astrophotography, something that personally I've become pretty um, enamored with over the last year uh, traveling and working for Panasonic Lumix. So with that, what we're going to do is we're going to jump over to my S1R, which I have attached into our A10 Mini here. Uh, so we can actually show you some of the menus, what they do, the effects that they have on an image, uh, and be able to actually walk through this together so that it's not just me talking and you guys can't actually see what it is we're doing. And so I don't really have to hold a camera up to the main camera here. So with that, let's jump over to the camera and let's start going over some of the landscape photography uh, tools that we've built into these cameras. So to start with, you know, with, with landscape photography, there's a lot out there for what, what you can capture, right? So there's a ton of different topics, ton of, di ton of different um, scenes, scenarios that you can be shooting with. And for most cases, there's a, a couple baseline, you know, settings that are going to help your creativity with what you have in front of you, so you don't have to necessarily spend as much time sitting behind the computer doing heavy edits, although we will also cover where the differences are with some of the things that I'm showing you in this camera, where they may not necessarily apply to your workflow. So to start with, as you can see here, uh, we're looking through the, uh, the S1R that I have attached. And I have the uh, info display up. So this is, if you were joined in a couple of weeks ago when we covered um, you know, some of the setups to get clean HDMI out, this is allowing all of the UI overlay to actually output over HDMI so that we can use this as a tool so you can actually see what's happening. Now, one of the, one of the kind of basic first things that uh, a lot of photographers that I've worked with and myself, what I use uh, is purely simply just the levels. So most of our cameras, actually pretty much all of our cameras have inbuilt levels like most cameras do across the board. So this isn't really anything new for most, most uh, photographers and videographers out there. But in our cameras, there's a couple ways to, to get into it if you're looking to turn it on, turn it off, find a way, you know, find where it is in the menus. Now on the S series cameras, by default out of the box, you'll see that on the back of the camera, you'll have a trash can button, which normally in playback is used for obviously deleting images and getting rid of them. But when you're in the standby mode, so getting ready to shoot where you're in this display, if you press it once, you'll see the levels disappear, press it again, they'll come back. Now the levels in the Lumix cameras are on two axis, so you have uh, tilt, so um, uh, rotation on it, and then you also have up and down tilt. So this is useful for obviously a number of uh, situations where you know you want to you may not have access to the level that's on your camera or uh, sorry on your tripod, 
uh, this is a good way to just kind of be able to make sure that your image itself is actually level and straightforward. Um, there are situations where, you know, using what's on the tripod may be a little bit better for you, um, where, you know, you may have a leveling head on that tripod, but ultimately, whatever the camera is going to tell you is going to be pretty accurate as far as level to using the gyros that are in the system. So it's a, you know, depends on which one you're more comfortable with. Personally, I like using the levels in the camera because they're there. They're overlaid on what it is I'm looking at. So I can also give a visual confirmation on say something in landscape like a horizon. I know that I'm level. I know that everything's just all set to go there. Um, so we're going to turn those off so that it's not cluttering the display now. Um, the next kind of thing for landscape photographers is obviously if you're used to working with um, uh, some sort of histogram on a camera, we do have histogram built into the cameras as well. Now, the histogram is a fairly straightforward histogram uh, that's in our cameras. So we're going to get into that by going into the monitor settings here. And we're going to go up to remember where it is under monitor display one and then we can turn histogram on and you'll see that I can position this pretty much anywhere that's going to work best for me on this display it isn't resizable but it allows me to move it you know out of the way for how I'm shooting so I can have it off to the side so that it's not really that distracting in my image so we're going to go back in and turn that off now one of the cool things is um, this camera in particular, you may notice, I don't have the side touch bar enabled on the S camera. By default, the uh, side function buttons are not turned on by default. It is something that you have to go into the menu and turn on yourself. So for that, for landscape photographers, and really for pretty much any photographer, this is a useful tip. Uh, if you go into the main camera settings and then go into the touch settings, which if I go into operation one, go to touch settings, here I can turn touch tab on. And what you'll see is when I come back out to the main screen, I have that touch tab on the side now. And when I tap on FN, you'll see that I have that histogram quick access right there, as well as quick access to my Wi-Fi options. So very, very customizable as far as how you want to have the camera set up for it. So that's enough about levels. I think we all understand levels now. Um, the next thing here is, you know, picture profiles. So which picture profile do you use for landscape, portraits, nat you know, nature? Depending on, on your workflow, if you're someone who shoots JPEG and delivers JPEG, so say you take it as um, someone who shot Chrome film in the past, where you're comfortable with wanting to get it right in camera and deliver right away. Um, your picture profiles are gonna be your best friend for that. This is where you can you know, tune your different colors, get everything set up as far as contrast goes, the way you want it to look, uh, and have it embed into that JPEG that way. But if you're a RAW photographer, or you shoot JPEG in RAW, you should be aware that the picture profiles that you shoot in camera don't save visually to RAW files. What it does instead is if you open a program like, say, Lightroom, which is my current go-to um, photo editing software for now, um, though I keep changing that around a lot. So in Lightroom, when you open it up uh, with one of the more recent updates, you now have the option to tell Lightroom to automatically apply the camera's picture profile for it. So if I'm set shooting in standard, instead of using Adobe standards um, color profile, it will use the camera's profile. Now that gives you a good base so that you know roughly what it looked like in camera for JPEG color wise, then you can make your fine tune, you know, kind of um, tweaks to it with heavier hardware that your computer will offer. So now as far as profiles go for landscape, there's two ways that you can access these. So all of our cameras have a quick menu option, which in the S series and a number of the G series cameras, it's an actual Q button. Uh, in some of the point and shoot cameras, it's uh, usually bundled in with the trash can on the bottom. So in this case, what I'm gonna do on the S1R is I'm just gonna press Q and you'll see that that opens up my quick menu. Now, make sure my, okay, cool. So now that I have the quick menu open, 
Obviously, this gives me a ton of capabilities for customization, so everything on this display is customizable to what works for you. But it lets me go in and quickly change things like the color profiles. So by default, and again, this camera was factory reset, so this is how you would see it if you just opened it up out of the box. It may change depending if you've already customized this. But what we'll do here is, um, as you can see on the display right now, I'm using standard. So if I switch over to vivid, you'll see you get that more vivid, punchy color effect. If I change over to natural, it's a more muted, but as it says, natural color. Um, the S-series cameras have a flat profile, which isn't to be confused with V-Log. V-Log is a very different profile than flat in the camera. Um, this is just a flat-ish color profile. Then we can go over to landscape, portrait, monochrome, L monochrome, L monochrome D, Cine D, Cine V, and then some cameras have like 709. So you can see there's a ton of options, but for landscape photographers, some of the best color profiles that I typically work with for um, obviously landscapes or cityscapes is either the landscape profile, if it's called landscape in your camera, uh, it may also be called uh, nature in your camera uh, or natural depending on the system that you have. So between landscape and natural, this allows me a very neutral palette uh, if I'm using natural, this gives me a neutral palette to work with for when I bring the files into my computer to actually do my editing with. If I'm shooting just JPEGs and I'm not really worried about doing raw editing, then I'll set it into landscape, which gives it a little bit more punchy color. So you can see if I go over to landscape, certain colors on the color checker here, certain colors pop a little bit better specifically for landscape. So it kind of fits that, that look a little bit better. But in general, you can customize these however you want. Now, what I'll cover in a little bit later when we're gonna be talking about um, some, actually, no, I can cover it now. So the other way that you get into picture profiles, since like I said, there's a couple ways to do it, is instead of using quick menu, it's actually using the main camera menu. So what you'll see here is if I just half press the shutter, which in every single camera we make, half press the shutter gets you out of whatever menu you were in and back to main shooting, so standby. So now if I press the menu button here and I go to the main camera settings in the menu, you see that I have another option to select in uh, photo styles. So if I click in and I do it this way, this gives me a ton of control over each individual color profile. So in this case, for a landscape photographer, I'm gonna use the black and white profile. Um, a lot of times, like last week we talked about black and white, we didn't get enough time to really go into super detail about it, so let's cover it here. So for landscapes, I love shooting black and white landscapes, especially on you know, really harsh, bright days where you know, color, color images may just not look the best, or in certain circumstances, it's just the style that you may like, it's the style that I like personally. So here in this access way to get into the picture styles, it gives you a number of capabilities to come in and change things like contrast. You can change the actual tone curve on this so you can make it more like a traditional film response, which is an S curve instead of linear. But you also have the capabilities to add filters. Now, the filter effects for black and white, again, these are only going to affect the JPEG of the image. These won't affect the raw file but this lets me come in and digitally add what I would have added on film, colored filters to shift contrast, change the tonality of the image, and just give it a different look than just a straight up black and white conversion from color. So you'll see I can add yellow, and again, if I come in here and I actually use the um, uh, color checker here, you'll be able to see how these colors change. So right now we're on yellow, I can come in and pull up orange, red, green, and the biggest thing to look at is look at the red tag on the bottom left there. You'll see how drastic some of these change from red to green, and then you can turn it off. But what's also cool in a number of the cameras is that we have a grain effect filter that can be added as well. So if you really are someone who loves shooting film or you wanna get back to just some of the effect that you had with film, 
and the look that you have. Uh, we do also have the ability to add grain to these images. So no matter what ISO you're at, you can add a simulated film grain to it. Um, typically, if you off is digital, clearly. Low would be, in my, uh, my best explanation, low would be somewhere between, say, like 100 to 200 speed film. Standard would be something like 200 to 400, maybe 800, depending on which film grain, um, which um, uh, emulsion you were using. And then high would be like your traditional high speed film, so 1600, 3200 speed. Now these can be really useful for those effects if you know that you, that's just the style you want to go for. Does it all in camera and it just gets super straightforward. Um, and again, like I said, this is set up as in camera for JPEGs doesn't really affect the raw files when you go into this level, but it will tag the raw file that, hey, that image was shot in L monochrome. So before I um, move to the next piece on this, I'm just going to dig through here. I see a couple questions that were coming in here. Um, see if there's anything I can answer right now. Uh, what is the, uh, from Edward, what is the Lumix model you're using in session? So I'm using an S1H for the main face cam and I'm using an S1R right now uh, attached over HDMI. Um, the reason I'm using an S1R is because it has all of the features that will cover pretty much every camera we make so I can show everything, but most of these features are gonna be across what you'll see in pretty much every camera. Uh, let's see, is there any other, any other setup? Um, I see a lot of questions about tethering and uh, how to use as webcams. Yeah, as of right now, the cameras do need to use some sort of capture device, which if you go on to the YouTube channel, the first one of these Lumix Live setups uh, was actually explaining how to get your Lumix camera in current day to do live streaming with it. So um, if you check at the end of this session, you'll see a link over for that. Uh, all right, let's jump back over here, um, back into the camera. So the last thing I wanna cover for landscape photographers is high resolution mode. So if you have an S1, S1R, S1H, or a G9 uh, currently in, our, in a, the cameras that we offer that allow that, or that offer this, um, we have high resolution mode built in. Now what this will do is take eight images by shifting uh, half a pixel in uh, basically a circular pattern. And it will stitch those images together to create one high resolution image. So in this case right now, I've got the um, S1R, which is 47 megapixels. So when I shoot it in high resolution, I get 187 megapixels. So great for ultra high resolution shooting if you need that extra detail. But one of the challenges with high resolution mode has always been with a lot of cameras, you either had to do it on a computer or in camera, and you would deal with some artifacting for things like moving trees, situations like that. Well, in the S cameras and now in the G9 after the firmware update that we did a little while ago, we've added two different modes to high resolution mode. What this does is this allows you to actually come in and kind of tweak how that image is gonna come out in the end. So if I go into high resolution mode here, this is the menu that you're gonna see for it. You'll see that I have the ability to simultaneously record a normal shot. So this will record a standard, in this case, 47 megapixel raw file alongside the high res. I can do my shutter delay. So if I don't have a cable release, I can still program it so that I can press the physical shutter on the button, give it a few seconds, then it'll take the picture to minimize any kind of shake or motion that you cause by touch, touching the camera. But on the bottom here, you'll see motion blur processing. So what this does, you'll see there are two modes for this. There's mode one and mode two. Mode one doesn't do any processing as far as motion correction. So this is how you shoot it, the motion that comes up in the image, any potential artifacting, that's what's gonna be there. So mode one is really useful for say more studio oriented uh, uses of high resolution. So if you're doing product photography and you need ultra high res, mode one will be great for that. Mode two on the other hand is incredibly useful for landscape photographers. We typically have to deal with trees moving, the wind blowing, water rushing, things like that, that if you're shooting it and you're not 
not being aware of what that effect's gonna have on your camera and the image that you shoot, um, mode one will cause artifacts. You'll see duplicates of some images. You'll see some, some issue with, with images because uh, that item moved between those eight images. What mode two does is it intelligently, with the processing in the camera, uh, basically masks out any of the motion and then overlays the a, uh, uh, upscaled version, from my understanding, upscaled version of an image um, into those areas so that you get a seamless uh, overall image at a higher resolution. And it really just straight up works. Um, if you have one of the cameras that has this mode in it, uh, definitely go out and try it. Um, it's something that obviously since we're all still in relative quarantine across the board, it's a really cool feature just with a tree blowing in your yard or something like that or in a, it, you know behind your ho your home or apartment just try it you'll see the main difference between mode mode one and mode two when you look at those trees and the way they move um it it can save an image in high resolution for landscape photographers that would have just been totally destroyed with high resolution if you're deciding to make really big prints with it uh, or making heavy crops onto it so yeah so that's kind of the coverage for the landscape photographers. And obviously we're on a time scale here. So we're gonna kind of move on to the next one and jump back and grab a couple more of the questions in here. Um, so let's see, another question. Uh, I see a lot of the questions about tethering and connecting to PCs. Um, again, we did cover that in one of the last sessions. So if you want a little bit more information as to the current situation of how the cameras can get all set up, um, definitely take a look at that. It's fairly in depth. Um, but I see there's a lot of people in there giving you some, some feedback on that. Uh, as far as profiles go, um, I did see one of the questions here. What about 709 profile? Uh, and that's from Bricks Digital. So the Rec 709 color profile, uh, if you know that you're delivering this for broadcast, like a still image, then yeah, you could use it. Um, I think it's, it's fine for that. For general photography though, um, I don't really suggest using 709, uh, mainly because you can reconform a raw file to be whatever color you know, output you pretty much want it to be. There's more than enough dynamic range. Uh, shooting JPEGs in 709, if the output that you're sending it, it doesn't display the proper colors, it may not look right to the end where you're gonna use it. And uh, that profile may not print very well for like if you're actually still printing your pictures. Um, the other question here from Mark was, how is natural landscape different from scenery? Uh, that's the one that I f couldn't remember the name of before. So natural and scenery, um, they're not really the same. Scenery is closer to landscape in a number of the cameras. Natural is going to be very just kind of as its name says, it's natural colors. It doesn't really have much influence as far as what our representation of say red is as a brand. Um, that's what standard is. Standard is the, our color profile design for what we, we have developed as, as color. Natural gives you kind of just a very simplified, this is natural. This is what color should be coming in off. Um, processing obviously changes between any camera brand. So you'll see some differences between um, different setups here. Um, let's see here. Uh, I see a comment from Valerie with an LX10 and you're brand new to it. Um, so yeah, it, this is a little bit of a higher level kind of conversation with what the cameras can do. But I think there's going to be some cool stuff in here that, that may help you because we're going to be covering some... Uh, um, different focus modes, things like that, which are all relevant into our entire line of cameras. Uh, the next question was from Tyler. Let's see here. Uh, it's, it's an Atomos question, which I might not be able to answer, um, since I don't work for Atomos. Uh, does the Ninja 5 provide any increase in video quality because of the uncompressed signal or is the only real benefit the 4K 60p 10-bit? So that's gonna depend on which camera you're looking at. Um, like we covered a couple weeks ago, if you're an S1H user, the Ninja 5 is what you're gonna to need to have ProRes RAW support. Um, that can take the RAW signal coming out of the S1H and then uh, convert it into ProRes RAW with the recorder. 
Uh, otherwise, what you get as a benefit with using something like the Ninja 5 is you can actually record in uh, 4K 60p 10-bit, but in ProRes instead of the um, MOV or MP4 that we're recording in camera. So it depends on your workflow, which one ends up covering best for you. All right, so let's jump to the next topic here. So product photographers. So if you're a product photographer, you've um, you know, kind of looking at, at what, what this camera can do to help you out in, in your aspect of photography. And like we covered before, obviously the picture profiles are probably not going to be as relevant for product photographers because it's more about accurate color if you're doing higher end product photography because you're looking to actually get truly representative uh, color for those images. But there are a bunch of tools in here to help product photographers and make your job a little bit easier. So the first one I want to cover is actually white balance. So if you're shooting in a studio, you have a couple of options with a lot of cameras, right? So you can either set a, an actual Kelvin color temperature based on whatever your studio lights are. Works great. Set it up. You know that you're matched and you're pretty close to it. Uh, if you're shooting in raw, you're still probably going to tweak these anyway, but it still gets you right in the ballpark. But if you're shooting in situations where, you know, your client may want window light uh, or you want kind of more environmental product shots where it's outdoors, but you still want to be as color accurate as you, as you can, we have a number of uh, custom settings for white balance that will help you out in this case. Uh, so if you go into uh, the camera and actually open up the white balance menu, which I've done here, You'll see that we have in different cameras, we have a couple of these uh, custom white balance like saving banks here. So I'm on set one right now. What I can do with this now is if you see, it gives me an indication to press up to select white set. So if I do that, if I push up, you'll see that I get a highlighted box in the middle of the frame now. What I can do with this is in my studio, I can take my color checker now, I can change this to my gray card and bring my gray card into the image with the reflective light that my current home studio, quote unquote, is uh, showing me. So, so once you get that uh, box covered with the gray card, just push the menu set button. It sets the white balance now for that scene and your bank one is now saved for that, that lighting scenario. So to start with, you're gonna get more accurate colors. You're gonna have a better base to start with for that image. But once you're past that now, uh, say you want to actually now start doing multiple images. So one of the things I know that I've done in the past is where you're doing product photography and you may have to reposition things or you wanna take multiple images so you can compose, uh, composite them later for a set. So what we've done in the S cameras is we've added a shear overlay function. So what this allows me to do is if I take an image right here, so we're going to use this as my uh, initial kind of base image. If I click on menu on the back of the camera and I go into the cog, which is kind of more of the custom settings here, and I scroll down to the second to last uh, display three, you'll see I have an option for shear overlay. So when I go into shear overlay, I click set. Now I can change the transparency of this. I can have it reset so that if I turn the power off, it goes back to normal. But I can do image select. It looks through the card, just pulls up any of the images there. So I can now take this image that I have, push set on it. And now what you'll get is I have an overlay of that first image that I took. So say now I want to move my phone. I can move my phone and still get a referenced image of where the previous shot was. So as long as I haven't changed anything, I can now reposition all of these items so that one, the next picture I take isn't necessarily, like I'm not going to have weird clipping issues. This makes um, setting up multiple different shots, especially if you're going to have um, situations where you may want to be overlapping two totally different items, you can get it set up so that everything is kind of perfectly aligned and minimizing how much time you have to spend on the computer to actually do these things, um, these edits to get everything together. So 
With sheer overlay, like I said, you've got that there, but it opens up kind of another cool feature for uh, product photographers and in general, just a lot of photographers, and that's uh, doing stop motion. So if you're doing any kind of uh, production work or product photography or product videography, uh, stop motion can be a great way to actually evolve your, your content for different purposes. Um, you can create short little clips of video that just give something different, a uh, different way to express what the product is than you would with a normal still image or with video. Now, the Lumix cameras make this super simple and straightforward because it's all built into the camera. Again, that's kind of the, the, the big group here is that everything in this is all just internal. So you don't need any extra equipment. You don't have to you know, have anything done to your camera to be able to do this. So what we can do is on any of the cameras, you'll see that there's typically an option here to go into a time-lapse function which is what the base is. So right now, uh, I have this set into the quote, time-lapse mode. But when I push the menu, you'll see that it brings you right to the menu option here, which says time-lapse slash animation. So when I click on that menu, you'll see I can change the mode to stop motion animation. What this lets me do now is come in here and I have two options. I can either add it to a group that I've already taken, so if you're having to go back and add more to that stop motion that you created, or I can just start fresh, which is what I'm gonna do here, and I can either turn auto shooting on or leave it off. Off is probably better to start with um, because it gives you more time if you have a cable release or if you're using your phone to be able to um, Bluetooth trigger your, your camera, you can end up using that as your trigger for each image. But for this case, I'm gonna set it on auto shooting. I'm gonna set my interval to anywhere between one to, I think, uh, one to 60 seconds. So um, you're limited to one minute or one second, depending on your interval. So I'm gonna set this to three seconds here. So now what I'll do is when I half press the shutter button here, and I'm gonna flip this to manual focus, gives me a little more control over this, the uh, shooting situation. I can now just click the shutter, and what you'll see is that every image now gets that kind of sheer overlay that we were showing before, but lets me have that reference image so I can see how much the item is moving. So I can do things like get the camera moving, pop up the flash, and, and in this case, use it for however you want to have those images set up. Now, once you're done with it, just push the menu button, click on that time-lapse menu again, and then you can end stop motion. Just like time-lapse, this will actually compile this all into a video in camera, so you don't need any extra software to do this, and you have a file ready to go. When I create that video file, you'll see that it will pop up a new menu for this, uh, which lets me come in and say, I want to have it in 4K or 1080. I want to play it at 2430 or 60 frames per second. I want it forward or backwards. You hit OK, and then it'll process it in camera. So it makes it super straightforward to expand what it is you're offering a client. Or honestly, with uh, the stop motion stuff, I've just had fun playing around with it uh, recently. You know, you, the days start to kind of blend into each other after a while while you're sitting at home. It's cool to just kind of play around and learn some new, new techniques that your camera may be offering for you. So let me jump in and see if we have any other uh, questions here. Um, let's see here. Um, ba -ba -ba. From John, you'd like to learn more about star focus uh, capability for constellation photography. Uh, we do have at the end of this, um, so I have two more things to cover and then we're gonna talk about some astro features that we have. Uh, the other one here is um, shooting video with my LX100 and an external audio receiver. Do you have any tips to sync the audio in post? Uh, there are a bunch of tools out there. Pluralize, I think uh, Premiere has some tools. I think Final Cut has some tools. Uh, I'm not the best source for audio syncing uh, in video. 
but I'm sure with the community out there, um, there's got to be someone in the chat that can probably give you some pretty good guidelines for it, um, which is a great thing that I love doing these things is that we're collecting a ton of people here that all have similar interests and can help each other um, in different setups. Uh, question from Barry, uh, GH5, photo style is grayed out, can't access, uh, never had this happen before. Um, one of the first things to check is make sure that you don't have um, any of the filter effects turned on. If you have filter effects turned on, which uh, if you have the little touch tab on the side, you'll see a little uh, kind of palette icon. If I turn those on, uh, that disables a lot of uh, the kind of settings like, like you can see here, I can't change picture profiles anymore. But if I come in and I turn that uh, filter style off, everything's back to normal. Uh, the filters override pretty much everything else that's in there. Uh, let's see here, uh, if there are any other questions that I can check up here. Um, okay, all right, good, good to hear, Barry, good to hear. Uh, okay, all right, let's jump over now to um, some of the, the features in here that I think are gonna be pretty relevant to uh, some wildlife uh, and nature photographers. So, with our cameras, we have a number of focusing capabilities in the cameras that will change depending on what your discipline of photography is. Now again, we're focusing on the photography aspects of the uh, autofocus system right now. So when it comes to, to uh, wildlife photographers, I, not being one myself, I know that there are a number of different kind of ways that uh, focusing is typically done for wildlife photographers. Um, you can either be using the tracking focus mode, uh, you could be using either kind of the auto detection mode, which is it'll take the entire display and, and focus on what it can find. Uh, you can use just one area or a one area expanded. But what we've added in this camera and a, and a number of the recent cameras like the GH5S, G9, uh, GH5 I believe, and obviously the entire S series, is if I go into the menu and I look at the, uh, again, I go into the cog settings here for displays, I can go in and I can look at the monitor display setting one and scroll down to this option that's called AF area display. So if I turn this on, it does a couple of cool things for me. So right now I have the camera set in one area AF. It's where I typically have my camera set up normally. But what it lets me do now is go in, I can click and change my focus mode to one of the group modes. So right now I have it, it's gonna select one of the, the oval zoned area, area. So when I turn that on, you'll see that I now get an overlay on the screen of those focus uh, points. So now I have a good representation to say, if I'm tracking that bird flying uh, across the sky, I can have this positioned in an area where I know that anything that crosses into that area is where my focus is going to be prioritized to grab onto the subject that's there. So it ends up becoming a really easy tool to not necessarily have to let the camera uh, you know, make its own decision it lets you just kind of have that area where you want to have it set up and, and know that that's the area that's going to be focused on. But what's also cool about the system that we offer is, like most people know, Lumix is very well known for the video side of the industry with things like 4K 60p, um, the 10-bit files that we can record in camera, and then now with the ProRes RAW support that's coming um, in the coming weeks we've been able to take a lot of that capability that we've pushed in the video side and been able to apply it towards photographers. So we have modes in the cameras which are called 4K and 6K photo mode. In this case on the S1R, it's set up right now in 6K photo mode. Uh, so once you change it in and you enable 6K photo, you get a couple of different options. So for a lot of wildlife and sports photography, we know that we shoot at fast burst rates. So most cameras are anywhere between, say, 
seven to 14 ish frames per second. If you're looking in that kind of category of a sports camera, but what we, what we've, uh, been able to, to set up on these cameras is we can use the video files that the camera can produce to increase the capture rate and still allow you to be able to actually shoot bursts of images that you can then be able to go back and pick which one you want. So if I, uh, actually since this is connected over HDMI, it's not gonna let me show the UI for it, but I'll have to kind of explain it a little bit. So what it does is you have a couple of different modes for this. You have 4K, 6K photo just burst, which uh, in this case is going to be just um, you know, how you would normally expect to photograph. Press the shutter button down, it just keeps capturing until you let that shutter button up. So pretty traditional, we're all fairly used to how burst mode works. Then we have the start stop mode. So this functions more like a camcorder would. So it's press once, starts recording, starts saving out those images, press again, then it stops and you're all set. The third option here, which is grayed out because I'm attached over HDMI, is pre-burst. So if you're a wildlife photographer or a nature photographer or just anybody that's, that photographs um, subjects or items that are predictable in motion and you're trying to capture that perfect moment, the pre-burst option has blended a lot of what we've done for video cameras into a photo mode. What this is doing is this is taking, it's, it's always storing uh, 30, uh, 30 frames into the camera's internal memory. So it's basically pre-roll if you're coming from the video side. But what it lets you do is as you're half pressing the shutter and you've got your, you know, you're ready, you're waiting for that moment to happen. As it's storing that 30 frames, the second you press the shutter button down, it empties that buffer. So 30 frames are immediately saved. And then it takes another 30 frames and stores them all as one uh, file for you to review. So what this basically means is that you no longer have to necessarily worry too much about your reaction time to capture that specifically perfect image. Now, there are some trade-offs with using modes like this versus using just a burst mode where you're predictively starting the frame, uh, frame capture before the motion happens. When you use 4K and 6K photo mode, it does save these images out as JPEGs. So they're not raw files, they're a little more uh, straightforward as what you have. Now you can record 4K or 6K depending on which cameras you have. So in cameras like the G9, S1, S1R, S1H, you're recording um, up to 6K, which will be an 18 megapixel image, where 4K is going to be 8.3. So you still get a really good, useful um, file out of it if you know that you're just going to be printing and maybe not doing a lot of heavy post-production to it. But it still gets you those images in situations where you may have not been able to even get the image prior to having something like this. Um, let me see, I just saw a couple questions come in through here. Um, uh, from Nadine, uh, you got in late. Um, this, is, this goes live again back on YouTube once we're done, so you'll be able to see this right afterwards. Uh, question from Mark. Uh, I have a TZ200, which uh, I believe is ZS200 in the US, uh, with 4K uh, mode. Uh, how do pictures in this mode compare in quality to the 12 megapixel shot? Uh, so it's going to be a little different. So the ZS200 is a 20 megapixel one inch camera. Uh, the 4K, 6K modes are lower resolution, so in that camera I believe it's 4K photo mode, which means it's only going to be an 8.3 megapixel image, and there is going to be a crop on it because it crops in for processing to be faster. So you will see a little bit of a, a resolution drop compared to 20, but in certain circumstances it's, it's a tool to be used in certain situations where getting the image may be a little bit more important than the ultimate high resolution for it. Uh, with cameras in the point and shoot realm though, you typically do also have higher electronic burst rates on it. So electronic shutter modes, 
which could be a good medium for you if you don't want to give up resolution, but you want to have higher-ish burst rates. Uh, so you can check out some of the um, setups for uh, electronic shutter on it versus 4K, 6K photo. Uh, let's see, the next question here is, I just saw one. Uh, someone was asking a question about back button focus, though for some reason, okay, the message was retracted. Uh, if you have that question, um, oh, uh, is there any chance I could do back button focus in video modes just like in photo mode? Uh, back button focus in video mode would be push to focus. Um, you can, your normal AF button is going to allow you to do that, or if you just press the button, it'll be an AFS, push the button, it'll focus, and then stop. Um, otherwise, it's just going to be continuous focus. Uh, you would set that by going into the menu and turning off continuous focus, uh, continuous AF uh, for your camera. Uh, when you turn that off and you start video, it won't auto focus in continuous during video. Um, but you would still have to push uh, uh, the AF on button to push to focus. So hopefully that helps there. Uh, okay, let's uh, jump back in here with uh, some, the, some of the setups here for portrait photographers. So portrait photographers, um, obviously now we have a lot of time where you could either be a professional portrait photographer, which... For those of you out there, I'm not saying that I am a portrait photographer by any stretch of the mean uh, uh, word, but there's a lot of tips, uh, um, features in the cameras that can help uh, either professionals and and really help a lot of people that are just getting into it on, you know, technically how the camera can help. So a number of those here are like we've talked about already a couple of times, the picture profiles again. So if you're doing portrait photography. The important thing is is color. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you have color for um, accurate skin tones, accurate representation of you know hair color, eye color, things like that. So when you use the different color profiles in cameras, you may notice that there are certain situations where you know, if you have it set to vivid, skin's going to look either too magenta or too yellow. It, it may have extra pop in color that you may not be desiring for that image. Where if you go into, say, portrait mode, which the cameras have, it typically what it's doing is it's taking those tones that are typically found in, in um, typically found that shift skin tones and it's muting them down a bit so that you're getting a more natural-ish um, uh, skin reproduction. Now for these, again, these are only affecting JPEG imagery. You can go into the, uh, depending on the camera that you have, in Lightroom you could uh, go in and reapply that color profile to it so that you could actually kind of get a baseline where you were. But most important, for um, portrait photographers is, again, that ability with white balance on the camera. So if you have your white balance set, it makes your life so much easier for um, shooting portraits. Uh, just like we did with um, the product photography, in white balance, you can come in, set your white balance like we did before using something like a color checker like I've got here. And it just means that you're gonna be able to have that ultimately truly accurate color for your images where you may not have that just letting any camera do its color profiles for you. But outside of those profiles, uh, you have the ability to go in and obviously choose some of the different uh, monochrome profiles for some portraiture. Uh, in this case, I again like shooting kind of more of a contrasty black and white portrait if I'm shooting any portraits. I don't usually shoot too many portraits these days anymore. But I can go in, tweak the tone curves, tweak the contrast on it to, you know, how I want it to look. It lets you kind of be able to control every, every aspect of it. And again, for those that have maybe just joined us, uh, what I can do is click Menu, go into the main camera settings here, into Photo Styles, 
And this is where I can come in and tweak each of those photo styles to my liking. So if you know that you like a little bit more contrast in your portraits, you can go in, add a little bit more contrast, add a little bit, uh, you know, harder S curve on it. If you really like that, you know, that look where your highlights are really bright, shadows are really crushed down dark. Um, it just gives you a ton of that control. And the best thing is that, again, with mirrorless, what you see is what you get. So while you're looking at it, you're able to actually be able to see how everything is going to represent. Um, before I jump to the next topic here, I see a couple more questions that have just come in here. Um, question from Nadine. I like to use my Nikon 50 1.2 on your G9. How do I use zebras to make, uh, make sure I'm in focus manually? Uh, so zebras are for exposure. Focus peaking, I think, is what uh, you might be referencing. Uh, focus peaking, when you're using lenses that aren't communicating with the camera, you do have to manually tell the camera to to uh, activate the focus assists. Um, so if you're attaching that lens to it, make sure that the selector for AF is set to MF. That will just tell the camera that you're in manual focus and it should uh, natively just enable focus peaking. Um, in a case like that, you may have to go in and tweak some of the focus peaking settings uh, depending on what is better for your, uh, your vision. Since a number of the focus peaking modes in the cameras have different intensities, different colors, uh, it can shift what, what works best for you. Um, in my opinion, I typically like using more vibrant colors for focus peaking. So if I go in, in this case, and I'm actually going into the menu here to change the focus peaking, uh, you'll see that you'll have a ton of different colors that you can change the focus peaking to. Um, play around with them, see which one works best for what you can pick up on the screen. Uh, and it typically will, will help there. Uh, you do also have the option that if you're in manual focus and, I, and you push the AF button in, you can do punch in which lets you actually see a magnified view of the screen that you have to check for focus. Um, but ultimately, just make sure the camera's in manual focus and it'll give you the best um, overall look for uh, the focus peaking to activate without having to add any extra buttons in there for it. So let's see, were there any other questions on there for that? Uh, explain teleconverters and ETC. Is it real optical zoom or just crop with lower megapixel? And that's from Steven. So um, ETC, so electronic teleconverter, uh, is more of a crop and upscale uh, in the cameras where if you're using uh, an actual physical teleconverter on the camera, that's an actual optical uh, change to the, lens, uh, to the uh, optic path. Um, anything in camera where you're using either ETC or teleconverter, depending on the camera that you have, and, it, and I have to be that kind of vague on it because there are a ton of different ways that it's implemented depending on the camera and resolution you have. Certain cameras, if you're using it in video, will go to pixel to pixel readout or a more cropped in pixel readout. Uh, others, it just won't let you use it because there is no uh, punch in for it. But in most cases, anything in camera is going to typically be a, a digitally processed crop in. Now it can be a very high quality digital process to crop in and give you a better looking image uh, for more reach. Uh, but I'm a firm believer that pretty much anything you can do optically is gonna be, in most cases, gonna be a better way to go. Uh, knowing that there aren't teleconverters capable for every lens that's out there in micro four thirds um, or in S series it does challenge it a bit for some. Uh, that's where ETC and the built-in teleconverter functionality can help you. Um, you're not really gonna lose much quality at all. Digital zoom is where you lose much more quality because you're massively punching in on that image versus just looking at more general kind of um, processing. So stick away from digital zoom, stay with ETC uh, or the teleconverter function. If you have to do it in camera, best option is an actual teleconverter. 
Uh, we do make them for select lenses on the G series and we do have the set for the S series 70 to 200s that we have on the market, so. Uh, okay, let's jump back. Oh, um, let's see here. Uh, next question was from, uh, I think it's, it's Werner. Uh, I can't uh, reach cloud and web services over Bluetooth. It only works over internet and Wi-Fi. Why is it so slow? Um, so this is kind of a twofold thing. So not every region has the web service and cloud service uh, capabilities. Uh, it depends on just what's available in your country. But uh, Bluetooth won't send data like that at all. Uh, and Bluetooth would be slower than in most cases what, what you'd be looking at because of how much has to be uh, transferred over. Wi-Fi uh, will be more dependent on a, a couple of factors. How close you are to the Wi-Fi access point that you're using, uh, what band is it working in, 5 gigahertz or 2.4 gigahertz, how congested your network is. So like if I try to connect any of my cameras right here at my desk because I have my desktop on Wi-Fi, my phone's on Wi-Fi, I have a bunch of cameras here. There's a lot of interference and I'm in an apartment complex so we have a ton of interference here. Um, it can be much slower uh, to actually be able to send things. Um, there are a couple apps that you can download for your phone that will let you kind of tell which bands are free. Um, it won't really help you as much with this because the switching is going to depend on which band you're attached to. But ultimately, um, Wi-Fi, making sure that you're close to your router, if you're on 5 gigahertz, that you're not on the other side of the building because the higher the gigahertz, the worse it is going through walls. Um, that can help speed up some of that Wi-Fi. Uh, we are actually working on a uh, quick little video tutorial on how to actually set the camera up to do wireless send while shooting on your home network uh, with just what's built into the camera. So I'll be able to actually shoot with this camera and have it send right to my desktop or my NAS uh, network attached storage here. Um, so we will have some videos explaining how that works and some of the things you need to watch out for. So keep an eye out for that as well. Um, okay, uh, let's go to the, uh, the next little setup here. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, continuing with um, portrait photographers, uh, if you're really working with fast aperture lenses, so say 50 millimeter 1.4, like our S-Pro on the S-Series cameras, uh, or something like the 42.5 Noctocron on the G-Series cameras, um, face detect focusing is going to be a big benefit for portrait photographers out there. Um, no matter which system you're in, 1.2 and 1.4 are shallow depth of fields. So if you're new to this, what that means is that the, the depth that is in focus is very short. So you may run into situations where if I'm using, say, just one area of focus uh, on this camera here, uh, and I don't have that perfectly matched on the eye, I could be getting part of the cheek, the nose, just the eyelashes and not the eye, uh, depending on how shallow the depth of field is. But what we've built into pretty much every camera that's out there from the Lumix lineup is face and eye detection in all the cameras. Now what this gives you is the ability to actually have the camera set up so that, and let me just do it this way. So it lets you have the camera set up right now so that I have, so that I have this camera set up right now so that you see my face, you see my eyes, and it gives you a box over the eye that's gonna be in focus. So what that means is that when I'm using those fast aperture lenses, I can now know that my focus is going to be on either left or right eye, I know which eye it's gonna be on because of the crosshair, and I'm less likely to have situations where I think that I'm in focus, but because of my aperture, I'm slightly off. So face and eye detect is gonna be a huge benefit for photographers uh, in, in that sense. If you're on a G9, S1, S1R, S1H, or GH, no, I don't think the GH5S has it. So the G9, G, um, S1, S1R, S1H, you also have the animal detection mode in here too. So if you're a portrait photographer of our furry friends, 
you can also use that mode. It will detect the animal, and it does bias, uh, from my experience shooting with it, uh, it does tend to bias the focus towards the face of the animal, though it's not focusing on the eyes. Uh, but it, it allows you to have that, you know, one less thing to have to necessarily really worry about um, so that you're not having to struggle and then have to look in post and see, ah, did I really get that focus right? You know, where was it? Um, so face detection, eye detection, and animal detection are built into all the cameras to help you, um, again, be able to capture images with less stress. So the next, uh, the next topic that was on here was flash photography. Now, I don't have all the flashes here. Um, in fact, I only have one flash here. But uh, if you're a portrait photographer, we had a firmware update come out a few weeks ago. Or actually, at this point, it's a few months ago. I forget what um, overall what day it is anymore uh, recently. Um, so we, we had a firmware update come out that added support for obviously our flashes. So there's the Lumix uh, flashes FL200, FL360, I believe, or FL360 and FL580. Um, those flashes, they're from us. They're going to be the ones that in the S series you're able to shoot at 1 320th of a second sync speed. Uh, in the G series, they're the ones that allow you to do the internal control for wireless and, and uh, multi-group shooting. But there are, if you're in the S series cameras, we do have other uh, compatible flashes for the system. Uh, namingly, the big ones are the uh, Profoto support. So there is Studio Profoto support added in the S cameras with the recent firmware updates. So you'll be able to use the wireless triggers with studio strobes and, and have your control and TTL and everything set up in camera if that's how you work. Um, those modes are controlled in the camera when you're on the main uh, camera settings menu and then just go down and look into flash and you'll see you, this is where you can have some of your wireless controls. So when you have the triggers on there, this is where you get some of that extra control. And on the YouTube channel, we do also have uh, the additional uh, videos that kind of walk you through how that pairing works, which ones you need to look at. Uh, and something to be aware of is definitely make sure that you're looking at the right triggers if you are looking at the Pro Photo lights for uh, studio strobes. Uh, make sure that you're looking at the ones that are compatible for the Lumix cameras. So after portrait photography, um, you know, let's, let's talk about some of the astrophotography. Um, like I said, this is kind of uh, one of the areas that I've become very enamored with recently uh, and will be teaching classes on this uh, over the next couple of weeks. But astrophotography is one of those things that, you know, it takes a ton of patience, good planning, uh, and the results you can get out of it are stunning if you have the time and especially if you have tools that can help you, you know, plan those shots and get those images that you may have never thought you could get before. So a couple of the cool features, and I'm actually going to switch back to the main camera for this because I can't show the things on the back of the camera because they don't output over HDMI. So a couple of the really cool features that the camera offers is something called night mode. So if you've ever been out um, at night, obviously photographing, and you've run into situations where, you know, the camera turns on, the light turns on the back of the camera, and you're just blinded because of how bright everything is. Um, we've built into the S series cameras and uh, the G series as well, a night mode on the camera. And what this gives you is it takes the camera and sets it up so that when I'm on the back of the camera here in night mode, actually I can do this part on HDMI because you can actually see it that way. So what this lets me do here is click on menu, go into night mode, and I can turn the monitor on and the LVF on. What this does is this changes um, how the camera looks. What this does is it, instead of uh, actually affecting anything in your image, it's changing the rear display uh, so the actual LCD as well as the viewfinder and it's just turning them red. So all you're going to see is red. This will help you work much better in low light so that your eyes can still stay acclimated to the stars instead of having this really bright light show up and then 
you know, you're blinded for a little while while you can, you know, try to go back and shoot. In addition to that, there's also a couple modes that the cameras have built in where in normal traditional shooting, we would normally be using, say, constant preview, which will let, will have the camera stop the lens down and slow the aperture or uh, slow the shutter speed based on the settings you've given it to boost the brightness of the display or darken the display based on your exposure. But for astrophotography, that's not necessarily a big benefit um, because if you have to reposition, you don't want the camera waiting 13 seconds before it refreshes the display so you can see it. So what we've added here is a mode called Live View Boost. Now Live View Boost has two modes, just like high res So we have mode one, which is it's going to gain up the rear display. So it's going to make the rear display brighter for you but you're gonna lose a little bit of refresh rate on the display. So it's a fairly good balance. If you're out somewhere like uh, when I'm in, in, out in Denver, uh, if I go out into some of the dark skies areas, Live View Boost Mode 1 typically is good enough for it. Um, I'm able to see stars on the camera, um, be able to actually compose my image, and I don't have to worry about that that delay of say 13 seconds for the camera to refocus or uh, to uh, update so that I can actually see. But then there's also mode two. If you're in situations where it is ultra dark, really, really dark, mode two will reduce the, res uh, reduce the refresh rate even further. So it'll be very laggy and choppy, but the gain will be brought up really, really high so that you can still compose your image. Now, both of these modes, uh, as opposed to using something like Constant Preview, are going to be infinitely faster to work with than just turning on Constant Preview and waiting that 13 seconds for an image to refresh on your display. Um, you also have the ability to come in here on set and tell it if you want this to work in only manual or if you want it to work in program, shutter, aperture, or manual. So it gives you a couple of different options depending on how you shoot. Now this mode is an automatically activated mode. So if I turned all the lights off in this room, you'd see that it would start to boost up. Uh, I'm not gonna do that just cause then I can't see and I'll be blinded by the computer monitor, but uh, it allows you to be able to actually boost the image automatically without having to go through an extra step and process of digging through a menu, turning constant preview on, turning it off, getting it how you want it set up. Uh, let's take a look and see if we have any other questions in here. Uh, ba, 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 ba. In, face, uh, in face detect, is it possible to choose which eye is in focus? Yes. Um, with the cameras that have joysticks, uh, when you have face detect and it's selected on the face, push the joystick in uh, and it will cycle, it'll lock and cycle between left and right eye. Um, let's see here, uh, next questions here. Home exposure is, uh, so, um, okay, uh, that was answered in there already. So with, with that, that was a very, very fast hour uh, that we just went through. Um, like I said, uh, this was a little bit of a departure from our normal, uh, you know, Lumix live events that we've been running on Facebook and now on YouTube. Uh, we definitely want to keep doing more of these type because it seems like, um, a lot of, Oh, thank you for reminding me, John. I apologize as I was wrapping up star mode. Um, for those that are just jumping in here. Uh, there is a star AF mode uh, in the Lumix cameras, which will automatically activate when you're in the 225 uh, focus mode. It's not something I could get activated in here because it's too bright and there are no stars. Uh, the way that system works, uh, John, is what it will do is when you're in 225, you have the camera positioned and you're focused, when you ha or uh, you're getting ready to focus, when you half press the shutter, and you keep it held, you're gonna see that it's gonna to try to focus, it may not find anything, and then you're gonna get a wider box that's gonna show up. And what it does is it drops into a low light focusing mode, and typically you'll see a red dot with um, low, uh, I think it says low on it. And what that's doing is it's looking for pinpoints of light. So it will assist you in situations like that. Um, that's 
fairly deployed across, I think, pretty much every one of the cameras, at least that's current for the lineup. Uh, it can work really well uh, when you're in really straight up just total darkness and you don't necessarily have maybe the live view boost feature. Uh, it is challenging to use. I'm going to tell you it's not the fastest way to work. Uh, manual focus can still be better. Uh, but if it's what you have, because the camera either doesn't have the distance scale uh, for the focusing modes, uh, or it doesn't have live view, uh, make sure you're in 225 auto focusing point or 49, depending on which camera you have. Uh, and when you're on that, just half press, let it go, and you'll see that it will automatically drop into that starlight or star AF uh, focusing mode. So yeah. Uh, okay. So with that, um, I know that there's a bunch more questions uh, and there's a pretty good conversation thread going on in there. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us again this week for another one of these Lumix Live events here on YouTube. Uh, these things, like I've said uh, each week, these things are a lot of fun to, to, uh, to do with everyone here. Uh, we will be going live again next week. Uh, the plan is going to be actually with another interview style. So we'll be going back to what we were doing the last two weeks. If you guys like seeing this kind of content, uh, the mix up between uh, interview styles, these kind of more tech, you know, tech heavy uh, demonstrations, let us know in the comments, let us know on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, you know, reach out to us. Uh, these entire, uh, you know, kind of sessions are built so that we can connect with you guys. Uh, and you know, kind of answer your questions. I know we don't get to every question here on the chat, but we uh, do have a couple of our team in there, you know, answering questions. I can see Jack is in there and he's been helping around answering. Uh, but with that, uh, again, thank you for uh, tuning in. Uh, can't wait to do this next week and we will see you that time.